This symposium is an annual event that typically caps off our data science for the public good student program. And this year we are partnering with Virginia Tech, whom we've had the privilege of working with for a number of years. Today's agenda includes a fabulous keynote speaker, Joe Salvo, former chief demographer at the New York City Department of City Planning. We also have project presentations by our students who have worked hard with their research mentors and on their teams on various public good research projects. So it's gratifying to us to be able to offer hands-on learning opportunities. This is an ongoing ambition at UVA in the data science field where students work on real issues and challenges in society and for the public good. So together with our stakeholders, we are building the capacity for evidence-based policy development and practice across all levels of government and all types of communities, as well as building a new data science savvy work workforce ready to bring data in service of the public good. I wanna thank our sponsors for their continued support as we continue to foster civic engagement. Mm -hmm. These include Westat, the Washington Statistical Society, NORC at the University of Chicago, the American Statistical Association, our studio, and Sage Publishing. So just a little housekeeping before I introduce today's keynote speaker, Joe Salvo. All attendees are on mute at this time. At any time during the presentation, you may submit your question via the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom window, and we will answer these after the presentation. I will help facilitate this and we'll get through as many questions as we have time for up till about 1 p.m. At one o'clock, we are going to share a video that includes a description of each project that was pre-recorded by our students to give you a quick teaser of what they'll be sharing in the project presentation breakout rooms or sessions at 1.30. So we'll end this portion of the symposium and we will then close out the Zoom event and invite you to join the student presentations through a different Zoom link that will be available in the chat, or you can Google UVA biocomplexity events. So hopefully all this makes sense. It does work, trust me. Um, so now let's shift gears and I want to introduce today's speaker, Joe Salvo. I have the privilege of working with Joe in his current capacity as an Institute Fellow with the Biocomplexity Institute at UVA. He is also currently a senior advisor to the National Conference on Citizenship. Joe has more than 25 years of experience in the management of major demographic programs. He was and is involved in the analysis of large data sets for local applications related to policy formulation, needs assessments, and program planning and implementation. He has extensive experience in all things census. This includes history, methods, operations, and products. This expertise in census makes him uniquely able to analyze demographic data and explain this information to policymakers who in turn use these data during policy formation. So as you will learn, Joe's work has been crucial to the formation of more yeah. widespread evidence-based policy. Joe served in the New York City Department of City Planning from 1982 to 2021. He held positions of senior demographer, deputy director, director, and before his retirement in 2021, he was the chief demographer. He was also an adjunct associate professor at Hunter College and a demographer at the US Census Bureau. So this distinguished career has earned Joe many awards and accolades, too many to name them all, but we're going to state a few of them, a few of the noteworthy ones. So he received the Public Service Award from the Population Association of America, the Founders Award from the Citizens Committee for Children of New York, and the Ebo Bolton Award for Community Planning from the Citizens Housing and Planning Council of New York. Joe is also a fellow of the American Statistical Association. So today, Joe is going to share his wisdom and knowledge in his talk titled, Better Data and Measurement for Local Public Policy Decisions. <clears throat> So thank you, Joe, uh, for taking the time to be with us today. And I am now going to hand it over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. <laughs> um, I will try my best to live up to that wonderful introduction. Um, when I was asked to give this presentation, I did a lot of thinking about what I could offer that might be unique or might be special um, for everyone to hear. And what you'll hear today will be um, uh, 
a bit of a reflection on some of the work that I've done in New York. Um, you'll be hearing about the work that I'm currently do, doing as part of the Biocomplexity Institute initiative. But the theme of today's talk, if you ask me what the theme would be, it would be about thinking big. <clears throat> You're going to hear words like ambition, aspiration. Um, and you're also going to hear that all the ambitions and aspirations, if they're worth your time, will involve some risk. Um, <clears throat> but you're going to hear the phrase locally relevant a lot, because that's where I come from. Grand theorems are wonderful, but they're truly relevant only insofar as they relate to the daily lives of people, their quality of life, and the communities they live in. This is my orientation, having spent many years exploring ways to make data relevant for the people of New York City. It's time now for me to take that message national. That's the way I view my role right now as part of the work at the Institute. The data world before us is changing, <clears throat> moving beyond the days when we look at single surveys for answers to questions. Um, of concern to the nation and for local decision-making. Alternative data sources are being increasingly embraced, not only in an effort to fill the void that we all know is occurring uh, as a result of decreasing survey response, but to enhance what we know, tapping dimensions of important issues in new ways. You'll be hearing about a joint effort that UVA and the Census Bureau are undertaking to harness the power of multiple data sources. One proposed paradigm shift in the US is to create data products that focus on purpose and use, such as understanding changing employment patterns during the pandemic or changing migration patterns due to climate events, which I will talk about in a few minutes. The scaffold for this shift that I'm going to talk about is currently being developed at the Census Bureau in the form of a unified statistical frame that integrates the individual frames into a collective whole. Similarly, the pillars of the Canadian paradigm focus on user-centric service delivery, leading edge methods, data integration, statistical capacity building, and most important, sharing and collaboration with a variety of partners. If, if you go to the July issue of the American Statistical Association's publication, Amstat News, you'll see the Chief Statistician of Canada, Anil Aurora, say that currently 40% of Statistics Canada's programs are based in whole or in part on data available from administrative and alternate sources. Finally, even beyond the US and Canada, uh, an exciting new area has, is, is developing in using statistics to measure progress towards sustainable development goals. There's a roadmap that the UN has developed on statistics for sustainable uh, development goals, or as we call them, SDGs. And all of these are locally relevant. And, and that's the key. <laughs> these are transformational in that they promote representation of all groups. They promote equity on things like, for example, the position of women um, in different countries in the different countries of the world. But I want to begin with some items from my experience about what applied demography in a local government means and offer you a few cases in point. And specifically one case that involved in the 1990s that involved a lot of risk in New York City. Now, I admit right at the outset that my secret or not so secret agenda is to turn you all into demographers. So with that, if we can go to the next slide, I want to talk a little bit about what the priorities are when you're a local demographer, which has essentially been my career. Number one is being proactive about getting people counted in the census. I don't have to tell anyone on this Zoom today that the census is the basis for just about everything. It is our major reference point. It is the major provider of data for very small areas of the country. And it is important to promote the census. In a minute, I'm going to tell you about what we did in the 1990s to do this as a case in point about making use of alternative data sources 
even before the current wave um, uh, or the current initiatives that we're, we're going to talk about. Uh, in, in the 1990s, the Census Bureau created this program called the Local Update of Census Addresses, which I'll tell you more about in a minute. But it also goes beyond the technical. It goes to the heart of what the census means to the people of a big city like New York. Now, one of the things that I've heard time and time again is, oh, people in New York, you have all these resources, you know, uh, small places don't have those resources. True. But we also have 3.4 million housing units, okay? And we have eight and a half million people in the city of New York. It's it's, it is gargantuan by any measure. So when something threatens, um, when something threatens response in the census, as demographers, we needed to react. And we reacted in two ways, principally, well, we reacted in many ways, but <clears throat> two that I want to mention, one has to do <clears throat> with helping those people who reach out to uh, uh, to uh, obtain response, to elicit response, with statistical modeling that we used in order to look at the 200 plus neighborhoods in the city and classify them on a scale of how difficult they might be in, in, the, in, in the way of response. We created a statistical model. We worked with the people who conducted outreach, <clears throat> bringing science to bear on this. The other way we did it was that um, we helped the New York Attorney General in the uh, uh, litigation involving the addition of a citizenship question on the census questionnaire, uh, opposing it on the grounds that it would indeed have an impact on self-response, especially in the Hispanic communities uh, of the city. So uh, we became directly involved. That's what it means to be proactive. Now, the second item on this list involves empowering communities through access to data. One of the things that I worked on for, for, for a number of years um, was the development of uh, publications and tools to empower communities. Now, what do we mean by this? Uh, local communities, many local communities, and you can relate to this throughout the country, they do not have big budgets. They operate on a shoestring, as we say. Um, providing them with data so that they could apply for a grant, so they could uh, quantitatively establish a need. Uh, it can be something like uh, assistance for seniors. It could be something like uh, childcare, the need for childcare. You want an empirical basis for this, the need for a particular language program. Um, historically, if I go back to the 1980s when I joined the department, um, increasingly, the communities that had dollars would rely on consultants to come in, and you know, that's that's a gig um, that I actually have right now, and that other people have. So I'm not holding it against the consulting industry, but that means many communities cannot have access to those services. So one of the things that we worked very hard on was to come up with tools. Um, the latest of which is called New York City Population Fact Finder, um, which allows a local community group to look up and look at their data for their community and fill out a grant application or establish a need. And the third item on the list has to do with bringing methods to bear, um, data, uh, uh, scientific methods of data development and analysis to, import, to uh, inform decision making. It could be shortcomings in the 2010 census that we established occurred in New York in a few areas and helping our health department calculate uh, better uh, uh, vital rates. Um, that is rates of disease incidents in particular neighborhoods where we knew there was a shortfall in population, uh, for example, of, of children, um, helping them do a better calculation. So this way they could allocate their resources better um, and hopefully not declare that there was an epidemic in an area where frankly there, there, there really wasn't, but it was a function of a shortcoming in the, in the denominator in, in in a, in a rate, helping the schools figure out how to anticipate where growth in student populations will occur. Um, 
helping the city put together a strategic plan to mitigate a climate crisis, a heat event, a flood, <laughs> all of the things that we now worry about uh, uh, almost on a daily basis. Bringing science to bear. Science is powerful and bringing it to bear is very, very important. Um, but let me just say this. There are other considerations that go into placement of schools. So I'll just put it out there. And our job as demographers is to bring the science to bear. The ultimate decision may or may not reflect, best reflect those scientific principles, but we need to fight for those scientific principles and, and their usefulness and utility. And finally, personal growth, uh, learning from colleagues, <clears throat> mentoring the next generation is also a big priority. Um, uh, let me just give you an example. Um, as part of the work we did, at the, we did at the department, we would regularly send our material out for review. We send it to journals to publish, to see whether, whether our standards were indeed up to where they needed to be scientifically. Um, we would collaborate on an almost continuous basis with the Census Bureau in an effort to help them understand our take on a particular issue. So with all this in mind, let me turn now to an, an example of a calculated risk that we took in the 1990s, and it involved the integration of data, it involved administrative records, uh, and it all starts, next slide please, with what I said earlier, being proactive, using data and knowledge. This is a case in point. You see here, we have a building in New York City, a housing unit. What used to be a garage is now an apartment. Next slide, please. <clears throat> if you look at the census, and admittedly, this is quite simplistic. I admit it from, this, from the start. You create a list of addresses, you mail to those addresses, and you request that people respond to the census. Okay, you gather list, you check the list, you mail to those addresses, and then you follow up on people who do not respond. Sounds pretty simple. Take a look at this doorway. How do you deliver questionnaires to a building like this? Quite difficult task. Next, please. So the Census Bureau uh, essentially said in 1990, uh, it was widely uh, <clears throat> acknowledged that the 1990 census had substantial undercount. Substantial undercount, not only that by, uh, not only in total, but by race and Hispanic origin in New York City, that undercount was upwards close to a quarter of a million people. <laughs> net undercount now, we're talking about uh, net loss uh, because of the undercount of uh, about a quarter of a million people, 3% of our population. Uh, in 1994, the Census Bureau in, in collaboration <laughs> um, with a bunch of data users and with the Congress, um, well, essentially the Congress created this in, in, in tandem with the local data user community, created the what we call the LUCA program, the Local Update of Census Addresses program. This program authorizes the Census Bureau to share the list of addresses um, that they use in the census with local governments. The locals sign an agreement to keep the data confidential and they have access to the list. This was the first time. In 1990, we were running blind. We did not know what the list looked like. So local governments can use their own data sources. Next slide, please. Now, what are some of these data sources? <laughs> Believe it or not, in 1997, New York City basically had one phone company. It was called the Bell Atlantic Telephone Company. And we uh, collaborated with their engineers. We uh, obtained electrical accounts from, uh, from uh, Con Ed. Um, we used administrative records for, on taxation from our finance department. We used certificates of occupancy for buildings uh, from the buildings department. We used building violations, and we used a ton of field work to evaluate and verify these sources. We took a really big risk <clears throat> trying to convince City Hall and the leadership of the city that we needed to do this because we detected that there were a lot of addresses missing from the address list. But this took a lot of horsepower. Next, please. And these were the results of mining all that data. 
as a result of this program, we gave the Census Bureau 439,000 addresses that were not on their initial list. And you see that distribution by borough with the city. <clears throat> Look at Queens, New York. Queens has a lot of small buildings with extra apartments. 19% of its housing stock, 13% of the housing stock in the city now. In fairness to the Census Bureau, they immediately found over 100,000 of this 439 when, when they went into the field. And then after 2000, we conducted an experiment with them. And we asked them, of all the operations you have, how many addresses evaded those operations? Essentially, how many addresses did we give you that were totally unique? And the answer is about 150,000. And if you look at average household size, you're talking about a contribution of well over 300,000 people uh, that were added by virtue of a program that used administrative data from a local area, essentially putting the city over 8 million, 8,008,278. I'll never forget that number. Um, I had to deliver it myself to the mayor, 8008278. And that number was a product of all this work that we put into it. But what were the risks? We had to go get funding on our own. Uh, we were quite entrepreneurial and our government encouraged us to be so from a, a couple of foundations because the city could not hire people to do field work uh, very quickly. We had to go through this whole process. So we obtained dollars so that we could put people in the field on a Monday we'd have a, a queue of people ready the previous week and we put them in the field using the dollars that we got from at least one of, of the foundations that gave us money. Um, <clears throat> we had to convince City Hall that the use of 50 or 60 people within our agency and other agencies would be worthwhile. There was a real risk here. I had many days where I sat in my favorite bench, in my favorite park, looking at the sky, trying to figure out whether I had made a good decision, whether we had made, excuse me, the leadership of the agency had made a good decision. <laughs> what is the <clears throat> reason for all of this? You got to take some risks and you try to quantify the risk involved in doing so. But those risks and the utilization of alternative data is what we're talking about essentially today. The next slide, please. These are the kinds of things local governments need to deal with. <clears throat> we need to deal with the differential undercount. There are issues involving commuting, especially now, given the fact so many people are working at home. We have the issue of working at home and the differences between different sectors of the economy and the ability to, to have people work at home. Um, it's easy to say if you're working uh, uh, in a job as a demographer that you, yeah, you could, you could do a lot of your work at home. You still need to go into the field, but you still can do your work at home. But if you're driving an Uber, if you're delivering food, uh-uh, that's off limits. How do you deal with that? How do you deal with those changes from a local standpoint and the effect on local businesses or what we call the gig economy? Uh, what about the deployment of broadband? What about migration? <laughs> uh, the issue of people picking up and going because maybe the environment that you're making decisions about is not conducive to them staying. How do you know that? You know that because we have data. Next slide, please. So look at what we're dealing with on the gig front. <clears throat> look at these two um, headlines here. Uh, on the left, racial and ethnic differences stand out in the US gig workforce. What has happened as a result of, of the pandemic? Gig workers on the front lines of the Corona's pandemic lack basic protections, the issue of equity. On the migration front, we have, on the one hand, some research saying people are staying put more frequently. Uh, I'm sorry, people are staying put uh, to a greater degree. And then on the other hand, we have the movement that's associated with some big metro areas like New York, uh, New York City specifically, uh, involving a reaction to the pandemic. And then we have the issue of nursing homes. Uh, nursing homes, a very difficult circumstance involving the pandemic. 
Uh, the enumeration of nursing homes was very, very difficult in the 2020 census. Reimagining the uh, living arrangements of older persons is a general issue of concern to the whole country, especially as we age. Next, please. So we have all these headlines and you have the locals trying to figure out what to do. Enter curation of data, okay? Enter what I refer to in my introduction as a universal frame. This idea that you integrate the resources of the various, uh, 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 various divisions, various parts of the Census Bureau, demographic and economic, you put those together, and then you link that with administrative data, with third-party data. This innovative state is called, we're calling it the curated data enterprise, underlining the word curate. What we're trying to do jointly with the Census Bureau is in, empower and enable the Census Bureau scientists to come up with new measures that use multiple data sources that use them to provide more robust, timely, and comprehensive measures, all that are locally relevant. So what we're going to do now is we're going to take this larger kind of grand scheme, and we're going to now move it down. What does this mean for the locals? Next, please. This is the framework that this curated data enterprise offers. Okay? it's provides a comprehensive, rigorous, and disciplined foundation based around use cases, in other words, real life applications. The goal of the framework is to illuminate the capabilities of, of the CDE, as we call it, support its development, and to provide what we refer to uh, as a scaffold for a use case, but more than that, a process to develop information collection. In each box of this framework, you see here, we start with the purpose and use framed as a research question, and then we develop working hypotheses and continue through each step. We have one of my favorites, the data discovery step. In a minute, I'm gonna to talk to you about migration and the research that I did with Stephanie uh, uh, Stephanie Ship on migration and the kind of data discovery uh, uh, that we uh, undertook and what we found. And you do this through each of these steps. At each step, there's curation, there's communication, dissemination of results. And you'll notice on the right side of this chart, there's uh, the uh, equity and ethics review. So you communicate and disseminate, but always have in mind what ethics and equity issues might be involved. The process is not linear, it's iterative. Any of you who've conducted research know that nothing works in a nice, you know, easy sequence. It's a guide for research on implementation, essentially. Uh, and again, we look at some point to curate and to perhaps potentially automate. Next slide, please. For those of you who want to follow up on this, uh, these slides will be made available. There's a link here of this past spring. We put out a website and explains everything you always wanted to know about the curated data enterprise. Next, please. <clears throat> now, let's get down to some of the basics. Thinking like a local. Why do we care? 70% of the 32,000 or so places in the U.S have fewer than 4,000 people. So this big city demographer is essentially telling you that all the action is in small places, all right? Uh, I've been fortunate to involve, be involved in hundreds of data applications, <clears throat> um, helping city agencies, nonprofits, other organizations uh, in the neighborhoods of New York. I view the neighborhoods of New York City as these part of these uh, this place configuration. Essentially, what happens in Flushing, Queens is in many ways uh, similar to what happens in a town uh, uh, in the Midwest in terms of the kinds of data that might be available and the kinds of data that might be mined in order to provide 
for example, the response to water resource problems in the Southwest, or changes in the economy as a result of the pandemic in a Midwestern town. Next, please. So what does it mean to think like a local? Well, as you saw in the previous slide, the locals make decisions and the locals receive the data. Uh, they're also on the receiving side of, of the data that is the basis for those decisions. So I wanna focus on three knowledge areas of, of concern to local planners. One is the local economy and business. How are, a, how are residents able to sustain themselves? This is a basic question that any small town official or any big city uh, uh, economic planner will focus on. Are residents reacting to the pandemic with their feet is another big question. Migration, what is the impact on population of domestic migration flows in the case of, uh, in, in this use case? And then third, <clears throat> what about the most vulnerable? Uh, pers older persons in nursing homes. We need to think like a local. How do we do that within the, uh, the framework that I've been offering you today? Next, please. Let's first look at the gig economy. What is a gig job? Essentially, we're talking about people who work potentially for multiple employers, who work on shorter, longer-term contracts. They mix and match, okay? Um, their activities. This is the opposite of what it means to work for a single employer for a very long period of time, okay? Um, it is, in many ways, what is happening in the economy currently. Unfortunately, especially as a result of remote work, I, I would add, unfortunately, our data sources are not up to measurement of this. Um, if you look at the American Community Survey, the Current Population Survey, you will see that most of what we do is retrospective, that we collect data on what people have done, not what they're doing, especially as, as they're doing it. There are lags in the data. Uh, imagine how useful and I, um, how useful data from 2019 would be in the, uh, in the pandemic in 20 and 2021. Not very much, not very useful at all. The other issue concerns granularity. Uh, we need more granular data in order to measure things. Let me give you some examples of, of some of the data that is available. Next, please. Uh, the first of these, uh, this comes out of the Census Bureau. In fact, they just put out new data for 2019, I believe, uh, on non-employer firms. These are firms without employees. These are essentially people who are working on their own, okay? people who are out there in their own businesses, and you see tremendous growth. But I wanna note here, this growth has been occurring prior to the pandemic. 1998, you see the number of businesses, you see what it was in 2018, and it continues to grow. But right now, our data are lagging by two or three years. And trying to assess what happened in the pandemic, we need alternative sources. Next, please. These data come from the freelancers Upwork, uh, essentially this is data on a survey of freelancing uh, uh, persons in the economy. Uh, and again, uh, if we, we look at the percentage of the American workforce that are freelancers, I'm not going to vouch for the fact that it's 36% exactly. It's a lot, okay? Depending on what source you use, that number can vary substantially, but it is increasing. It is important, and it was affected dramatically by the pandemic. A lot of people, as a result of the pandemic, took on freelance work. And that's what this shows. The number of new freelancers increased during the pandemic substantially. It meant a change in our workforce. Did we use official data to make this determination? The official data, as this evolves, does not exist. We need to put mechanisms in place to measure things in closer to real time. Next, please. Now, here's a bottom line. <clears throat> this is from 2018. This is pre-pandemic. You can bet this was exacerbated by the pandemic. If you take a look at the income quartile here, you see very quickly the capacity of people to work from home 
is most prominent in the upper uh, income quartile. It is not at all prominent in the lowest income quartile. If you take this and you layer this on the pandemic and the issues involved in the pandemic, what you realize very quickly is all those people who were in food service in the bottom 25th income percentile were really hit in the pandemic. And we have a level of inequality and broad, broadly speaking, inequity that the pandemic has created and we struggle to measure it. Next, please. Let me turn to migration for a minute. The traditional measures we have of migration, where did you live one year ago? We use that a lot and it's a very valuable measure and we continue to use it, okay? But we can do a lot better. A small town mayor wants to know what's happening as the pandemic works its way through his community, as it hits workers, as it hits the potential or lack thereof of remote work, he wants to know or she wants to know what's happening. We can't do it with retrospective measures, but our discovery process that we went through that I described earlier um, has uncovered the use of cell phone detailed records by countries outside the US, in Africa and in Asia, where people monitor interregional migration using cell phone records, movements of people. So some of you might say, well, you know, that's a really complicated thing. You know, people, people go different places and they take their cell phones everywhere and all this. There are models now in the uh, um, premier statistical journal, um, premier demographic journal, that is, in the U.S. demography is the journal, which has two articles in the past few years with a model for culling migration from cell phone data. We are learning from our uh, counterparts in other parts of the world. There's data on commercial movers that we've all seen <clears throat> in the newspapers. Now there's the issue, is it representative? Maybe, maybe not, but in the mix, remember multiple data sources, you hit the same point, the same jurisdiction with multiple sources and you create a model and that model shows you something that is beyond what you would know with any single source. <clears throat> now, this is not a model, but let me show you what New York did in the next slide, please. <clears throat> what New York did during COVID in order to get a feel for what was going on on the migration front. Um, this is an effort by the New York City Controller's Office in cooperation with the Department of City Planning to look at month by month changes in residential movement as recorded by the Postal Service. These are essentially changes of address. And you see that gray line on the left, that is Manhattan. And those are the months from March through July into the fall of 2020. The other dip is Brooklyn. If you look at the chart on the right, you'll see the darkest areas are areas where that movement was highest. What immediately occurs here, the immediate issue is equity. There are people who have the capacity to pick up and go to that second or third location, house, they might own or rent. There are other people, especially in the Bronx, in Staten Island, Queens, and parts of Brooklyn that don't have that option. And this is an issue from the standpoint of revenue. It's an issue from the standpoint of understanding what is happening to vacancy levels in the city, what's happening to the rental markets in the city. One year old retrospective data does not help here. Of course, now if we look at the data from 2022 and we look back, we can reconstruct, but the controller needed data in more close to real time. And here's the thing, right now within the Census Bureau, they have the data. The data is being used by the geography division. <laughs> that data is being used 
postal changes of address are used to update their address list for surveys like the American Community Survey. If that data within the frames and the CDE perspective is shared with the population division that studies migration, you have a powerful synergy. Uh, I never liked the word synergy, but I'll use it here. You have a powerful synergy that develops when you make use of data frequently that's in-house. Next slide, please. <clears throat> the last use case that I wanna focus on concerns those people in nursing homes. Among the most vulnerable, and here's the irony in this situation. The reason why we're pursuing this use case to demonstrate the power of this new framework, there's an abundance of data. There are tons of data on residents of nursing homes, on the jobs in nursing homes, on workers in nursing homes, on businesses, all contained within the frames. Those frames being demographic, geographic, <coughs> jobs, those frames, business, business frame, those provide different views of, of nursing homes. Next, please. Just to give you a sense, <clears throat> there's federal data from the CDC, from the National Center for Health Statistics, <clears throat> from the Center for Medicaid, Medicare and Medicaid Services, CMS. There's state data. There's data from foundations like the Kaiser Family Foundation. Next, please. For example, the Kaiser Family Foundation, <clears throat> all these indicators that are available to the government essentially, provided that partnerships can be developed to share these data. <clears throat> okay, that's very important. There's got to be an emphasis on partnerships. So we know a lot about what's happening in nursing homes. What do we do? How do we deal with this? How do we integrate? How do we integrate these data? Now, the next chart, this will be your uh, eye test. And I, again, we'll make these slides available uh, to anyone who uh, <laughs> so desires <clears throat> to take some of this apart. On the left, we have those four frames that I mentioned earlier, okay? I mentioned before that nursing homes are businesses, there are workers in nursing homes, there are residents in nursing homes, and then there's the geography of nursing homes. You bring all that together. <laughs> and then we have the baseline data that then gets brought together for data, for example, from the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services. They have over 20 data files on facility level, on the facility level for skilled nursing homes that includes information on emergency preparedness, ownership, staffing. The CDC and NCHS have data on from their long-term care surveys. They have residential care facility data um, <clears throat> for frequently at very low levels of geography. Um, again, you will see that reflected here as part of the baseline in that, that part of the chart in the middle, okay? By itself, this is a very comprehensive picture. <clears throat> but I want you to imagine, here's where we go with ambition and aspiration. I want you to imagine a platform that a local decision maker can go to and ask the question, how can I mitigate a climate disaster? I have five nursing homes, let's say, in my town, and I need to figure out what, God forbid, would happen if we have a major heat event, if we have a major flood event. Okay, and by the way, um, I'm in a city that may have its own data, a city like New Orleans. I may have my own data because I've been through a lot of this. So I have my own data, can you see as we move to the right, uh, on emergency preparedness. I know what my infrastructure, my transportation infrastructure looks like. By the way, the federal government not know. I know, I know how it, how it is, how, what the roads are looking like. I know what those uh, uh, bl roadblocks might be. Um, figuratively and literally, to getting people to safety. I know about the deficiencies, not only because of my own work, but I also know by virtue of those frames, by the virtue of the data that's in the middle of here, the curated data enterprise information. So I build this knowledge together for, on my own, and I go to this platform, and I am able to come up with a product that gives me an idea <laughs> on what might happen in a severe climate event and what I'm going to need to do in order to cope with this and save the lives 
of people who are quite vulnerable. To some degree, the Census Bureau is kind of doing this. They have these community measures now that they are working, working on. Uh, many of you in the audience might know them. Uh, they're about community resilience, where they're using data from NOAA, National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration, and other federal agencies to try to work locally. So we're well, we're on our way. Uh, and by the way, something I need to emphasize, the whole frames project is on, on the way. It's a matter of, of, of providing the resources and the horsepower to, to make this work. Next, please. So let me end with this. <clears throat> Our goal is to forge a path that leads to evidence-based decision-making to mitigate short-term impacts related to the pandemic, for example, and longer-term strategies to promote economic growth, just as examples. We do this with timely and accurate view of the current demographic and social characteristics of the population. I should always underline current because we have to work towards data in real time. And we need to know more about the economic conditions of individuals and businesses. We need data products that are actionable at a local level. The promise of the CDE is that it can address many of these statistical challenges. For example, how best to create criteria for achieving a successful level of data integration. What does it mean to bring data together? Okay, how do you develop criteria or standards for doing that? In that Amstead News article, that point is made rather clearly by the Chief Statistician of Canada, um, it was also made in a presentation he gave at a, a National Academy meeting in June, which is cited in that article. How do you allow for data access and dissemination? H how do you do this? In an environment where we have heightened concerns about privacy and confidentiality, how do you get people the data they need, but yet protect respondents? And then the big one, at least for me, how do you engender the trust necessary for partnerships with local entities that are meaningful. Reciprocal local partnerships. How do you do that? That is going to be a tough challenge because by definition, the locals don't have all the resources that the federal government has. Okay. The locals need to have something, something in it for them. They need to understand what the carrot is for them. And they need to uh, participate in the development of this framework, which is in their interest. They need to be part of this. And that is what we hope to do. And frankly, it's one of my reasons for the presence, uh, for my presence in this whole initiative, because I, as you could probably tell by now, represent the local perspective on all of this. So I'm going to stop there, but let me say this. I want to thank everyone for letting me uh, 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 participate today. But there are two things I want you to remember, okay? This is the first one. Next, please. <clears throat> if you can move, I like to say move the glacier, a few inches, you've moved and you have progress. And you've heard it many, many times saying uh, perfection is the en enemy of the good. This is kind of a, a variation of this. We're not even, we're, we're talking about progress in various forms. That's what you strive for. And then lastly, <clears throat> I go to the wisdom of, over here, of Dr. Seuss. You need to care a whole lot. <clears throat> Because if you don't, it's not going to get better. A lot of this has to come from the heart. It has to be something that you do as a scientist, bringing that goodness, that, that perspective to bear on real life problems. So I offer this as my kind of final statement, <laughs> courtesy of the Lorax. I thank you very, very much. Joe, thank you very, very much for a terrific keynote address. Um, we have a few announcements to make, but while I'm doing that, please put your Q&A into, or your questions into the Q&A button at the bottom of the Zoom. 
Um, several of you have asked for the slides. Uh, the video and slides will be available on the Biocomplexity Events webpage soon. But if you can't wait a few days for them to be posted, please feel free to send me an email and I will be happy to get them out to you sooner than later. I also wanna take this opportunity to thank Sally Keller who created the DSPG program, the forum and the symposium. Um, this has been a great success over the last uh, several years and um, our hats go off to Sally for having the vision to create it. Um, now I wanna switch gears and introduce Joel Thurston and from UVA, he was the DSPG lead this summer and Susan Chen from Virginia Tech. Um, I now turn this over to you. And Susan was the uh, DSPG lead at, at Virginia Tech. So uh, thank you for working with our students this summer. They had a terrific uh, summer and today they get to showcase their work. So Joel. We do have a few questions uh, for Joe, if you'd like to. Uh... Okay, we, that's right, take, we were doing that. Minute. Okay, um, thank you for the reminder of that. Oh, um, I think I was too focused on the script here. Um, okay, the first question is, uh, thank you, Joe, for focusing on state and local issues. Have you thought about not only access to these curated data, but also perhaps a suite of analytical tools for locals that they could use to improve the standardized local data uh, comparisons? This would seem to be much more efficient uh, than having each state local entity trying to develop their own suite of analysis. New York City has great resources, but many of these small local entities do not have those resources. Thanks. Yeah, um, uh, one of the things that we're discussing within our, our team at UVA, um, and one of the things that Sally Keller has emphasized is that um, if this is gonna work, it has to be, it has to be equitable. Um, and that what that says essentially is that the platform that I described before as admittedly an ambition has to be accessible by all users. Um, it has to be something that a local official can use as well, you know, as the, as the chief demographer in New York. If that does not happen, then we're only exacerbating the inequity uh, or the lack of access, the unequal access to data <laughs> that unfortunately is the case because of the lack of resources. So your point is well taken and um, believe me, it's on my mind a lot. Okay. Um, I'm going to switch to uh, a question by one of our students. Uh, the data sources that you mentioned are creative such as the telephone book to find addresses or the cell phone records on migration. How do you typically go about finding sources of data for your projects, or in this case, for the use cases? Well, some of the sources, interestingly enough, are public. Um, the um, postal changes of address data are public. You may need some resources to get them for a local area. Um, <clears throat> cell phone detail records, uh, that, is, that is a challenge um, because a lot of the access issues are new, at least in the U.S., I'm finding, um, but uh, uh, in the articles I cited in the journal Demography, um, they do indeed make use of, of those records. Uh, they are anonymized and uh, there are other entities throughout the country that are making use of those records. But if I told you I knew exactly what the uh, challenges are, as the specific challenges, I would be lying to you. I, I don't. Um, that is part of our discovery um, and they saw the chart that we created before. We know they have utility. We know that some people have access. <laughs> we know that um, they can be part of a model. Um, but at this point, the exact uh, uh, specifics regarding, um, uh, for example, how to get a comprehensive view of them is uh, it, it's not fully known right now. Um, what I cited earlier is there are some data records that are being used in articles that have been published for specific parts of the country. Um, in one of the articles that I cited, I actually show um, it's more of a theoretical piece about what it would look like to track migration between New York and Florida, for example. Um, but actual data from some African countries um, uh, that is actually published and out there. So it, it's going to be tough but it's worth it 
That's part of the issue. That, that, that's what I'm trying to get across. It is, it is necessary. The data are out there and we should be taking advantage of that. Right. So the next one is really more of a comment, but you might you may want to uh, offer a comment on this as well. So this is from the city of Las Vegas, Nevada, the Senior Citizens Advisory Board. Our challenge is data on seniors outside of nursing homes. I look forward to the CDE tools toward that end. Thank you. So. Acknowledged. <laughs> Agree. Okay. Sure. Agreed. That's good. Um, what was the most innovative and surprising strategy you've seen and can share for demographers getting important data in the wild and on the ground? Go and look. <laughs> when you see some data, try to find a physical manifestation of it because it increases your understanding of that data. The example I gave you up front about what it meant to add housing units to the address list only became real when we went out and took a look at the reasons why, with the pressure on the housing stock that was extreme in the 1990s and still is, people subdivided their houses. And in all kinds of interesting ways, a lot of it very, you could see. And until we went out to, say, to ask the question, what we're seeing in our finance data, what we're seeing in our buildings data, <clears throat> what are we missing? We went out and looked and saw what we were missing. Um, so in-field verification of local data is very important. And it's not only property data. It can be a, a variety of other data sources. If you're getting a sense that a particular community, for example, ha has a need involving uh, language resources, you go to the local community centers and you talk to people about uh, uh, about what they're seeing and experiencing. It brings the data to life. Uh, those are the kinds of things you need, you need to do. It's all about veracity of your local data. And I'll tell you, the Census Bureau really understood when we took them out and said, look at this and look at that. And um, it, it gives body to the statistical uh, interpretation of your data. Right. Um, so I think we can go a few extra minutes because our student videos don't quite go the half hour, but Joel, if you could start putting the uh, link for the ch in the chat, that's great. Let's take a few more questions. Um, how do you think increased industry collection of consumer data, such as social media companies, mm -hmm. affects individuals' wariness toward government collection of data? Does the idea of the public good resonate with individuals? Uh, therein lies a big challenge because we have the balance. We have individual privacy, the desire to maintain the confidentiality of people who report the data, and we have the very important social uses of that data. And we need to educate people to understand that while confidentiality is, is certainly very important, utility of the data is equally important. Uh, it, we, we can all go home uh, if we um, if we don't have data that are useful, we can just all forget it because it, we need useful data. So uh, balancing that is difficult, um, especially in an environment where social media, you know, seems to be uh, is all over. Um, there's a value to data from social media, but uh, uh, you'll notice I have not used that in my in my talk today because harnessing that is quite a different story than harnessing, for example, detailed cell records or postal changes of address records. But we look forward to a discovery process that's going to continue. There may be utility in doing that. But the main message has to be, yes, we want to protect your confidentiality, I mean, and respect your privacy, excuse me. But at the same time, uh, you, you achieve, a, you get a benefit from having your local town planner understand what's going on in your community so they're not making decisions that affect you in a vacuum. So I think we have time for two more questions, but just quickly to answer some of the questions I'm also seeing is um, the slides, again, you can reach those at by Googling UVA biocomplexity events and those slides and the video will be posted sometime over the next week. Um, 
So the next question is, can you comment on potential partners like the Cooperative Extension System or service, those professionals that are in every county and city across the United States? So they are, um, they work with communities, boots on the ground, uh, very much what we're talking about with, such as working with local communities on the data uh, and the curated data enterprise. Um, there's a member of our team and Stephanie, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, a, a professor at Iowa State University, her name is Sarah Nusser, who knows an awful lot about this and who works a, a lot in the rural communities of the country. Um, this goes, this is perfectly in line with the theme that we're following, that we're trying to level the playing field with tools that benefit across the board. And you bet there are issues involving broadband access, for example, there are issues involving, um, you know, the ability, like I said before, to, to remote work, um, uh, huge differences in the economies of these places relative to uh, cities, for example, that need to all be taken into account as we pursue this. Um, but uh, rest assured that this is a concern, but that is an existing infrastructure that we can make, a, make use of. And Susan, I don't wanna put you on the spot, but do you have any additional thoughts about this question? Oh, I think Virginia Cooperative Extension is extremely important in really understanding local pressing issues and also there are a fountain of knowledge with alternative data sources that we don't typically think of uh, using. And that's gonna be one of the things that we highlight um, today in our student presentations where we have partnered with Virginia Cooperative Extension and use their administrative data to start to address some of these issues. So very much so. Thank Great. You. Thank you. So one more question, and then we are going to turn this over uh, to the students. Um, so different communities have different needs and different requests when it comes to evidence-based data. For example, New York City focuses on immigration out of the city, while New Orleans is more concerned about larger weather events. How can larger government organizations create a reciprocal relationship that benefits both the needs of the large and small governments? And this is also a question from one of our students. Well, um, weather events are now affecting all of us. Um, I, I, I don't think there's a place in this country that can somehow consider themselves immune, you know, for those events, from those events. Uh, migration, domestic migration also affects everyone. Uh, there may have been a time when there were places in this country where people just stay put and did not move, but economic circumstances, especially those during the pandemic, may have changed that. And here's the interesting part of it. For some, the change is huge, and for others, maybe not so at all. That's what you saw reflected in those headlines. We are in some ways less mobile, but in other ways, very mobile. It depends where you are. Here's the key though, the metrics, the measurement, the curation to try to give people a meaningful measure across the board to gauge what I just met, what I just said, is the key here. We need to offer that substance, that curation, that measurement to everyone so they could make an informed determination. Is domestic migration a problem in my town? I'm seeing things, but do I have a representative view of what's really going on? Do the data tell me what I'm, you know, did the data back up what I'm seeing? Historically, you can't do that because the data are old and you're in the middle of a pandemic. So you pull out the postal change of address data and you try to do something with that. Or you go to the curated data enterprise platform, which has a number of things on it, some of which might come out of the cooperative extension program for a whole bunch of places in this country. And you draw an informed conclusion about what the data tell you. And then you compare it to what you see and then you make a good decision. Talk about ambition. That is ambition, okay, admittedly. But if we don't try, we'll never get there. Uh, we'll never make that progress. Well, Joe, I think maybe we'll see an uptick in uh, our students entering demography programs across the country, um, <laughs> which would be uh, great. Uh, I wanna thank you. This was truly a terrific talk. I think it's one that the students really liked based on the questions.